everybody. Welcome to our monthly Winona webinar. I'm Angela. I work at Winona and I'm here today with Dr. Kat and Dr. Green and I'm going to pass some introductions off to both of them and they are going to start things off for us today. So Dr. Green, take it away. Hi. Um, so my name is Mike Green. I'm an OBGYN. I also happen to be the chief medical officer of Winona. Um, so if you haven't been on one of these before, um, my background, um, I've been an OBGYN. I finished residency in 1999. Um, so my passion has been women's health um, for a long time. Um, and, uh, you know, we started uh, Winona a couple years ago. It'll be two years since we launched in April, um, but a lot of time before that in planning. Um, and really to try to bring, you know, really high quality um, hormone replacement therapy to our patients in a, in a very convenient and safe manner. Um, and we saw, you know, there are other, there, there were other companies that do this really well for men's health, for erectile dysfunction and for testosterone replacement for men. But there really isn't anybody big doing this um, for women. And so um, it's only fair that somebody does a really nice job of doing this um, for hormone replacement therapy as well. And that's what we're trying to do. Um, so we're here to answer your questions today, but I'll let Dr. Kat introduce herself. Hi, I'm, I'm Dr. Kat Brown. I'm, I'm a Winona physician in the Pennsylvania area, and also I just started taking care of patients in Florida as well. Um, I have uh, I graduated residency in 2008, and I'm an Army veteran, so the Army paid for me to go to college and for medical school, and so I traveled around a little bit. I did my residency in Hawaii, and then I practiced in Texas and North Carolina, but Philadelphia's home. This is where my family is and where I was raised, so I came back here. Um, and um, I've dedicated my life to women's health too. And um, I'm personally going through the menopausal transition. So this became a very vested interest in me um, because it spent much of my career taking care of OB patients and delivering a lot of babies. Um, but now I'm, I'm really focusing on helping women going through this transition in life because I'm in that group, I'm in that age range now. So, um, but that's me, I'm, uh, I have three kids and um, I, I like to stay busy with them and we like to travel, like to do a lot of other things. But let's talk about Winona and talk about HRT a little bit more. Actually, before we went live with the webinar tonight, we were just talking about how menopause care and HRT is becoming much more of a commonly talked about subject. If any of you watch the Super Bowl, um, of course, you may have seen the commercial that for VMS, for vaso vasomotor symptoms. So. I'm really happy as a gynecologist to see that now, like we're seeing commercials in the mainstream media um, about this. It's no longer something that women have to suffer in silence with, you know, that now we have a dialogue that's opened. Um, and certainly you can see some of the Hollywood stars out there talking about their own experience with HRT. And it's just becoming much more of a topic that we can bring up. And so women don't have to suffer in silence and they can bring it up and they can have that dialogue with their doctors and, and get help and not, and have a better quality of life. So um, I don't know if you guys saw that commercial, but that's certainly something that I was very happy about. Yeah, yeah there was also a, a big article in the New York Times uh, three or four weeks ago um, that highlighted uh, hormone replacement therapy as well and, um, and, and telehealth in particular for hormone replacement therapy. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm really glad that this is getting out there and people are more willing to talk about it um, because, you know, it's a real thing and it's a, it's a real health issue for people. And fortunately there's good safe treatment for it and there's you no know, reason people shouldn't be feeling their best and getting what they need and not being embarrassed to ask their doctor or, or go online and ask their Winona doctor about hormone replacement therapy. Absolutely. <clears throat> we got some questions. We have a lot of questions. Well, they're rolling in. Um, Good. Let me see. What do we have? Uh, we have a question about um, bleeding, still bleeding. Three weeks after starting HRT, I started bleeding and it hasn't stopped now 10 days later. So it's, it's hard to really answer that question with like a blanket statement because we kind of need to know a little bit more background about you personally. So you know, some women that are in that perimenopausal transition might still be having regular periods. And so, you know, having irregular bleeding when you've been having regular cycles may not be as worrisome. 
but there's there's an adjustment period for all women you know we're changing the hormonal environment in your body and so your uterus will respond to that and something um that's something you'll see is spotting sometimes irregular bleeding um but that's something that you should talk to your winona physician about a little bit more because they have your chart they have your medical history and they can really look at the dosage that you're on and um all those other factors and really discuss this with you in more detail so i would bring that up with your winona doc so that you can talk about that in more more detail yeah i'd also like to add you know it's not unusual to have um, some irregular bleeding the first month or so after starting the medications usually not too concerning um, and it's usually sort of a single event so you know this may happen you know in the first month or so it may throw off your first period if you're having periods this shouldn't be recurring month after month and if it is that's something that we really need to pay attention to um, so this is significant, obviously, and you should talk to your own physician, but it's really not so worrisome. But if this were to continue, so even if this goes away and you're sort of reassured that everything's okay, but if this were to come back in a month or two or three later, make sure that you um, talk to your doctor about that, your Renona doc, um, and they can guide you. So for most people, um, if this happens at the beginning like this, it doesn't. it's not a thing that keeps happening over and over again. So it's not like, oh, this is gonna make you bleed, you know, all the time from here on out. That's not generally the case. That's um, we have another question um, regarding low libido. Um, very low libido was the main concern for starting with Winona. I'm coming up on my third month and no, still no improvement. Can increasing the dose slash potency make a difference or is low sex drive not a symptom that HRT is meant to relieve? Well, HRT can certainly help with low sex drive and low libido. Um, you know, I don't know particularly like what your regimen is since, um, you know, I don't have your chart in front of me. So, you know, certainly talking with your Winona doc about the medications you're currently taking and looking at the dosages, we like to see what your other symptom profile, you know, what your initial symptoms have done in response to the meds you're taking too. Um, because there are some changes that can be made to help with libido a little, a little bit more, um, particularly the, the DHEA supplement that we have, you know, is a medication that when it gets processed by your body, gets broken down into estrogen and testosterone. We need testosterone as women uh, for libido. So that's something that might help if you're not already on that. Um, we could also talk about increasing the dose of that. Um, but the other thing too, is that I think that it's very, very important to talk to, I talk to my patients about this is that Libido in women is not purely physical. It's not something that's purely hormonal. The largest sex organ for women is actually their brain. And we have to be mentally in the game and we have to be mentally in a good place. So like if there's relationship issues, communication issues, if you you and your partner have been together for a long time and, and romance and foreplay has kind of gone out the window, you need to revisit some of those things. Um, and there's some other resources out there and other things that you can do as well. Um, but as far as from, a, oh, there goes my, my picture again. <laughs> Let me get it back on. I was talking. Um, <laughs> but I would certainly ask your Winona doc about this a little bit more in detail so that you can talk about your particular medication regimen and see if it needs some tweaking. Yeah. This is such a question we get asked a lot um, about DHEA uh, as well um, in the women's group and in the webinars. And I know that um, this question that's next um, is about hair loss and DHEA, but I was wondering also if both of you would speak to that a little more in addition to this question, just because so many people have concerns about DHEA as a regular topic in the women's group. So if either of you feel like expanding on that would be super. Um, it says, I've been on H HRT and DHEA for six months. I've had an increase in hair loss about a month after starting. Should I decrease my DHEA dose, taking it three times a week, for example? Well, I mean, so hair loss, I think the important thing to remember is that hair loss is a symptom of menopause itself, but also we can see changes in hair growth and hair loss with any kind of change in the hormonal environment in your body. So there's, there's a phenomenon called telogen effluvium where basically our hair follicles normally are in all different cycles and all different timers. And then with, with any kind of traumatic event or hormonal shift, whether it be childbirth or you know a health um, issue or um, infection, things like that, or even starting a hormonal medication, it can reset all those hair follicles so that they're more in tune with each other. And then you can have, rather than scattered hair loss throughout the month, you can have them more um, you know, together, like chunks of hair you know, loss at the same time. 
This is something that usually is temporary and it's an adjustment phase that a lot of patients go through. Um, generally adding estrogen into your daily regimen, estrogen typically helps all of our tissues. So it helps with the, the strength and the, the um, basically the quality of your hair, your skin, your nails, um, because estrogen really helps those tissues to be their best. So, you know, the DHEA dose that we use um, is low enough that typically you shouldn't see like male pattern hair loss with the DHEA supplement like you would if you were taking high doses of a testosterone. Um, so that's something that we, we typically would watch, but if depending on, you know, what your dose is and your particular situation, you could always talk to your Winona doc about that. Um, I don't know if you want to add to that, Dr. Green, if you have a lot of expertise too, if you want to speak about it. Well, I want to talk about sort of DHA in general, because we get a lot of questions about DHA. And the problem is, there's a lot of scary stuff about DHA on the internet. And the reason is that DHA is one of the, um, it's a basically a performance enhancing drug. Um, so I'm in the gym all the time. I don't use testosterone or the performance enhancing drugs, just chosen not to, but a lot of my friends do. Um, and so, um, you know, I'm around a lot of guys, um, you know, and, and some women too, you know, you know, really big muscular people that use um, a complicated, uh, testosterone and other hormones um, to increase your lifting. Um, and this happens in other sports as well. But DHA is one of the ones that's used. And they use really massive doses of DHA. Um, in fact, it's interesting, the men um, uh, use DHA and they add anastrozole, which blocks the estrogen component of the DHA because they don't want the estrogen side effects. But these are really big doses of DHA and they cause a lot of side effects um, as most of these performance enhancing drugs do. Um, and so when you go on the internet and you see all these scary side effects about DHA, that's really where it's coming from. So if you're using, you know, 200, 400 milligrams of DHA a day, yeah, you know, you got to worry about hair loss, um, you know, acne, aggression, um, uh, and, and, you know, and, and other health problems as well. Um, there can be an interaction in these mega doses with SSRIs to cause something called serotonin syndrome. So these are questions we get a lot because if you look on, various websites and good websites. I mean, the Mayo website has a big warning about this. You know, they're gonna give you these warnings about DHEA. We're really careful not to do that. So I personally will not prescribe above 50 milligrams. I know that 50 milligrams or less, we're not gonna get these scary side effects um, that, that you see in these mega doses. Now, once in a blue moon, you get somebody whose metabolism is different. Um, and so I have had a, you know, very small handful of patients that have reacted to DHEA, you know, in, 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 a, in a not great way, even at 25 milligrams. So in theory, yes, I guess it could be responsible for some hair loss, although that's, that's pretty unusual. Um, once in a while, you get somebody that starts at DHEA and they get this sort of aggression. Um, and it's interesting if they stop it, wait for a month or so and go back on, it typically gets better. Um, so those are, um, you know, and, and I don't, honestly, I don't know why, but it's been my experience that it tends to work. Um, so at these 25 to 50 milligram doses of DHEA, you're really unlikely to find what we, you know, these masculizing or, or, or um, uh, uh, you know, this testosterone-like side effects. Um, and that's one of the nice things about DHEA is that at 25 to 50 milligrams is really safe. Um, whereas if you're getting a testosterone injection or you're getting the testosterone pellets, they really need to be following testosterone levels. Um, it's really the only hormone, the only hormone replacement that we follow levels for um, because it can get dangerous when you're using pure testosterone. With DHEA, it really, at 25 to 50 milligrams, is not going to push the testosterone outside of a normal female range. You're not going to get these, you know, hyper levels of testosterone that's, you know, going to make you look like, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger or, um, you know, lose all your hair or anything like that. Um, so that's just a little thing about DHA because we do get a lot of questions about that. I hope that's helpful. Thank you. We definitely get that uh, Mayo Clinic article referenced a great deal. So that is a, an Achilles heel, I think, for a lot of people who look to places like Mayo Clinic for, um, you know, expertise or they think of as the gold standard. And so we get a lot of like worried patients that approach us with that as a reference. I can tell you in the very early days of Winona, I almost made a decision to stop using DHA because it was causing, you know, so much worry for patients um, until I kind of, you know, I did a lot of research myself actually before we started using it to make sure it was safe. But then 
kind of understood what the worry was, where it was coming from, and how to explain it better. And I think I'm glad that we've kept the DHA because it is a valuable asset um, and it helps a lot of women. Um, but there is a sort of scary thing on the internet you have to deal with. Okay, we have a question from Tara who says, I know Winona doesn't slash can't prescribe testosterone. Is there anything else we can do to help with sexual dysfunction, pain, lack of interest? I feel like this part of my life is over and that's depressing. Oh, it doesn't have to be over. I, I think that, you know, we've talked a little bit about the DHEA and that's certainly something that we can add to your regimen, but um, I noticed you mentioned pain. So if if you're having pain with intercourse, like the, if pain, if, if sex itself is painful, like penetrative intercourse is painful, then maybe supplementing with a topical vaginal estrogen cream might be helpful. So we get this thing in menopause, you know, when estrogen is lost from our body, we get what we call atrophic vaginitis or vaginal atrophy. Basically the, the vaginal tissues like lose their thickness, their elasticity, the lubrication. Um, and so those tissues, which normally the vagina has a lot of folds, we call aggregations, it becomes actually less flexible because those folds are lost. The tissue becomes thin and more brittle. So literally when you're having sex, if, there, if the tissue is not well estrogenated, you can actually get little micro tears and little traumatic changes in the tissue. It, it doesn't stretch as well. Um, so vaginal estrogen would help that tremendously. Um, I've had a lot of patients that maybe were not able to have intercourse at all, then started taking vaginal estrogen, um, and that can help that. And, and what along that line, it's like taking your systemic HRT will also help um, with the vaginal estrogenation, but the vaginal cream is kind of a faster way to replenish that tissue rather than taking the systemic. So I've had patients that take it both systemically, they get the estrogen on board for their these are motor symptoms like hot flashes and night sweats, but also use vaginal estrogen um, to help make their sex life better and help with that vaginal dryness and, and atrophy. So I think DHEA is a good option. I think vaginal estrogen might be a, an option to think about, to talk to your Winona doctor about. So it's not over. You, you should be able to have sex and, and be happy with your sex life until the day you die, in my opinion. It's an important part of life. <laughs> That's right, Dr. Cat. Yes. It's true, Great. absolutely. That's it. I like it. Uh, okay, let's see. Next question is, um, okay, now I, I am not getting any relief with the estrogen cream. Should I stick with it or alter my prescription? Well, without knowing more details, like your dosage and how long you've been on it, that kind of thing, um, certainly we can adjust dosage, that's one way. But sometimes trying HRT is like a little bit like trying on clothes. Like for so for some women using the transdermal or the skin through the skin methods, like the, the cream or the patch may not work as well for some women. They might do better with oral. And sometimes it's trial and error that we might want to try something different. So certainly if you don't feel like your symptoms are being adequately addressed with the medication you're currently taking, write to your Winona doc through the platform, you know, through the portal. And we can talk about dosage. We can kind of go back and forth and figure out if something might work better for you. I would encourage you to give it the three months um, yeah. because um, I had a, somebody message me today. They've been on it for like six days and they were frustrated that it wasn't helping them yet. Um, and I get it. You know, you're for a lot of people, this is a big decision. Um, and they've been thinking about it for a long time and they're really excited and they finally get it and they start it and nothing happens. Um, and that's frustrating. Um, or even more frustrating, they get some side effects, but they're not getting any benefit. And unfortunately, the side effects tend to happen at the beginning. Fortunately, they go away um, generally, um, but the benefits can take longer. So, you, you know, the, the sort of recipe we have is um, if you're on a, before your three month prescription. So if you're on a three month prescription or if you're getting month to month at that three month period, we're going to check in with you about a week before that refill comes up to talk about these things. How are you doing? Is it working? Um, you know, is it only working some, you know, what's not working about it? If everything's great, then let's not mess with success. But if not, let's talk about, do we need to change dose? Do we need to change, you know, from cream to pills or pills to cream? Um, like Dr. Kat was saying, um, but you do have to give it time. Um, it's not, this is um, not the kind of thing, it's not like taking, you know, aspirin for your headache. It's not going to work immediately for most people. I know you're going to see on the Facebook group, there are some lucky few, like a week, oh my gosh, my life has changed. And that's wonderful. We love that. But that's not necessarily the way it happens for most people. 
Um, so again, it depends how long you've been on it, but you do sort of have to hang in there a little bit. Okay, we have a question about HRT. It says, is the decrease of HDH something that can be addressed with HRT? I'm gonna let you take that one, Dr. Green. <laughs> so um, human growth hormone is um, being used um, and um, I honestly um, don't have any experience with it. I haven't prescribed it myself. Um, it, it's sort of, you know, kind of a popular thing out there. Um, it's different really than hormone replacement therapy. The idea with hormone replacement therapy is that your ovaries are becoming, oh, you disappeared again. Your ovaries are becoming less and less efficient. Um, she kind of looks like bewitched when she does that. I know. Um, and, um, and so the idea with hormone replacement therapy is really to, to add back what, what your body isn't making um, anymore to get you back to the levels that, that you were, you know, before this transition started. Um, human growth hormone, I think, is, is a little bit different. Um, but again, it's it's not something I have a lot of experience with. It's not something um, that, that we do use. Um, it, I have you know, zero experience with it, yeah. too. It's, it's just not something that's kind of in our wheelhouse as gynecologists, I think. Yeah. OK. Um, so we have uh, a question about um, energy and HRT. It says, three weeks in, I started to feel better overall, but the last few days, my energy has been so low, it was hard to get out of bed. Does energy increase with HRT? In my experience, it usually does, um, especially for a lot of patients that are experiencing sleep disruptions or insomnia or night sweats that are interrupting the quality of their sleep and their REM cycle sleep. Um, so generally when they get HRT on board, they start to sleep better. And so thereby the next day, their energy is better. So most of my patients actually report improved energy as time goes on with their HRT. So if all of a sudden you're noticing a change in the last couple of days, I would look back on your patterns, you know, to see is there something you did differently? Is there something else going on in your life? Is there increased stress? Is there, you know, something going on with your health? Um, I know personally when my energy tanks, it usually means I'm either harboring some kind of virus or there is something that my kids have exposed me to. And so then I really start pushing hydration and really focusing on sleep to make sure I stay healthy. So take a look at those other things too. Awesome. Um, okay, we have a question about uh, bio-identical hormone replacement therapy versus synthetic. The question is, is the cancer risk the same for uh, BHRT or regular HRT? I'll take that. Um, the answer is we don't know, um, honestly. Um, there really aren't, that I know of, there aren't any good big studies um, that have done a head-to-head -head comparison um, to look at cancer risk. Um, we do know that cancer risk is low for all HRT. Um, and in fact, um, if you look at overall life expectancy and quality of life, women that are that start hormone replacement therapy, whether it be bioidentical or synthetic, um, for age 60 that are appropriate candidates, have a longer life expectancy than women that have never been on hormone replacement therapy at all. Um, and so you live longer and you live healthier, and that's really what we're going for. Um, the one thing I can guarantee you in life is you're going to die. Um, so the one thing, like pretty much the whole world agrees on the statement I could say is that everybody has to die at least once. Um, I think everybody pretty much agree with that. Um, and so the idea is, you know, to put it off as long as you're living healthy, as long as you can. Um, how that you ultimately end up going, you know, it's going to be a crapshoot and we don't really get to choose that necessarily um but the idea again live long and healthy and hormone replacement therapy is going to give you a better chance of living a longer healthier life than not being on it if you're an appropriate candidate for it um so there are nuances of course so women that are on um uh, estrogen and progesterone have a slightly increased risk of breast cancer than women that aren't However, they have a lower risk of colon cancer. If done appropriately, they have a lower risk of uterine cancer and, and other cancers as well. So it all sort of balances out. The big one is that you have a lower risk of cardiovascular disease, which is the biggest killer of, of women um, in the world. Um, so that's you know a big deal um, to help you live longer and healthier. As far as the, can the difference in cancer risk, I don't know that there's any studies that have really looked at that. Um, however, um, you know, I think that bioidentical hormone replacement therapy makes sense because 
it's giving your body what it normally makes um, rather than giving something that's close but not quite the same. And so it's going to use it better. You're going to have um, less uh, breakdown products and it's going to bind to the receptors better, um, which is going to give you, you know, in general, a better effect with less side effects. But there really isn't, as far as I know, any good data about the cancer risk as far as being different. Okay. Well, we have another good question. I think every person here wants the answer to this. So if you have a crystal ball, either of you, please, please let it be known now. The question is, when will the weight loss begin? <laughs> um, it's a good question. So yeah, for every patient, it's different. In, in my opinion, I think that the other symptoms that you start your HRT for tend to get better first. You know, you tend to see improvement in your hot flashes and your night sweats. Uh, you know, the sleep quality tends to get better first. Really, you know, it's it's trying to bring your body back to its optimal state. And so sometimes that takes some time. Um, and so I, most of my patients start to notice maybe some changes like into month two or three. Um, but you have to remember that HRT is not all. It's also just not a magic bullet. You know, your metabolism has changed. And as we age so much about how we process food and, and how our metabolism works changes and things slow down. So you also have to change things up. You know, you have to really focus on eating healthy, eating the right foods. Um, for a lot of women getting into menopause, I find like a lot of my patients don't eat enough protein. And it doesn't matter how much you diet and how much you calorie restrict. If you're not getting enough protein in your diet, your body is gonna try to conserve everything it has. It's gonna try to conserve calories. So protein and fiber are the things I push to patients a lot because often they're not getting enough. Um, but the weight loss will come. You, you just have to put the work in, you have to stick with it, um, and then hopefully you'll reap those benefits. But yeah, I wish I had a crystal ball and I could tell each patient like, on Tuesday at this time, you will start to notice you know, the weight loss. I wish I could do that, but I would be working in Vegas if I could, I wouldn't be here, so. <laughs> <laughs> I just buy a big Powerball ticket. <laughs> right? <laughs> Um, we have a follow-up to the initial question um, that Teddy asked, which was about um, bleeding 10 days after starting HRT. Um, the, the question, the addendum to that is even if the first month, um, even if it's the first month after starting, isn't 10 days too long to bleed? I mean, it can be, sorry. Um, okay. And, and again, you know, there are, there are, tricks we have up our sleeve to help with the bleeding. Sometimes we can manipulate the hormone, have you take it in a different fashion um, to try and get this bleed under control. Um, if you're bleeding like crazy and you're feeling weak and dizzy, you need to go to the emergency room um, because um, people sometimes do bleed heavy enough. Um, I mean, I'm sure you see it too, but um, you know, it's, it's not unusual that we get a call from the ER. There's someone who's been having bleeding, heavy bleeding for, however many times, you know, and her hemoglobin is, you know, four and a half and she needs to be admitted for a blood transfusion. Um, yeah. So don't get in trouble. Okay. If you're bleeding like crazy um, and you're having symptoms, you need to, you need to be seen right away. Um, so it's, if it's annoying bleeding, um, then um, that's something that, you know, we can take care of um, through Winona and help you with. But if you're really like in trouble, don't, um, you know, don't ignore it. Okay, we have a question about um, hot flash relief with DHEA and HRT. So it says, I've noticed a fluctuation in the hot flash relief with DHEA and HRT. About a month in, they stopped completely, but at the two month mark, they have returned but with less frequency and intensity. Is this normal? Well, I mean, it could be your body's normal, um, but sometimes that can mean that your body's own inherent hormone you know, can be changing. So you could also develop somewhat of a tolerance to the medication, but your own ovaries production of estrogen might be changing. And so it might be that as your endogenous or your own body's production of the estrogen is decreasing, you might need a higher dose of, of the hormone potentially. So, you know, if it's something that just happens maybe one or two days, I usually tell my patients to watch for a pattern before we make wholesale changes in their dosage, because other things can affect your experience of these vasomotor symptoms too. So if you've been sick recently, if you have gone um, periods of time with sleep deprivation, you know, your temperature regulation can be off. 
Also, there are foods and things that we can get exposed to that can sometimes make these symptoms worse. So, you know, we know that alcohol sometimes can increase the frequency of hot flashes. Um, you know, other things that we can think about too is like, you know, I think good things like chocolate and hard cheeses, and things like that. Um, <laughs> all the good stuff, you know? Um, but I really tell my patients to look at their day-to-day -day life, like look for other changes that may have occurred that could have spurred the change in these symptoms. Um, and if there's absolutely nothing you're doing differently, then what I like to watch and see if this is gonna be something that's sustained and continue, or if it's just a fluke thing that you had a couple days that were kind of off before we make changes. But if it tends to be a pattern, then we can adjust the dosage and try to get you better relief overall. Um, okay, the next question um, is, from Christy, she says, I'm starting both estrogen cream and DHEA. How will I know if they are both working? What should I look for to know if one of them isn't doing what is expected? Well, so looking at your initial symptoms that you reported on your initial onboarding with us, you know, you're looking to see for, you're looking for improvement in those symptoms. So I've had patients that are very interested in uniquely in finding out what medication works versus another. And so I've had patients only want to start one medication at a time, kind of get tolerant to that and make sure that they're doing well with that before they start the second medication. So if you're really fixated on wanting to find out what each, oh, here I go again. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry. Wow, this really pushing you. <laughs> you're keeping it interesting when we rewatch this later entertainment value with this webcam here okay. um, <laughs> but if you wanted to start you know your medications in a staged fashion like that you certainly can but most patients that start both of them together what you're going to look at is those initial symptoms that you reported to just see when you notice improvement and changes in those so that's how you're going to gauge is you're going to think about those initial symptoms and see how they change with time yeah let me add um also that it's fine to start them at different times, but the longer you wait to start them, the longer you wait to feel better. Um, right. Because like I said, these things exactly. don't work instantly. So it's kind of a bummer. It's like, well, gee, now you're a month behind on these symptoms because you waited, I mean, which is okay. But it, you know, you're kind of ripping yourself off a little bit. Um, and uh, they, they do hit different symptoms, but they also sort of work together. Um, and so it's not an all or nothing either. Um, mm -hmm. Hey, Dr. Kat, this next question is for you. Are you using Winona products? And if so, how have things gone for you on the HRT regimen? How soon did you see positive changes? I am using Winona products. Um, and for me personally, really within the first month of starting to use estrogen cream, um, I really started to notice improvement in my hot flashes and night sweats. I sleep better through the night. I'm not getting up with night sweats overnight. Um, Really, the only time I'm really struggling with any kind of vasomotor symptoms personally is when I've been on a 24 hour shift as a physician and I'm sleep deprived. <laughs> the next day is not so great, <laughs> but that's because I haven't slept because of my, my work. Um, but other than that, things have gone very well for me. So I think my experience is very similar to a lot of my patients in that usually that first month they start to notice some improvement. Yay, Dr. Cat and the Winona products, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm such a cheerleader. Um, okay, Carly wants to know, um, she says she's so tired all the time and she's pre-menopausal, still gets periods and she's been on this for almost a year and not seeing an energy improvement. I mean, uh, if you're on, if everything else is good and you're not seeing an energy improvement, it may be, you may ought to make an appointment with your family doc. Um, there are other things that can sap your energy besides um, perimenopause. Uh, you could have low thyroid, you could be anemic. Um, so if you haven't had a you know a full exam from your your uh, family or your primary doctor, um, you know I recommend doing that at least every year or two. Um, but if everything else is good and that's the one thing, um, maybe time to think, gee, maybe this isn't from my female hormones, maybe it's from something else. It's not the only thing going on in your body. Um, so that would be something to think about. If on the other hand, none, you know, there's a bunch of symptoms that aren't performing well, then it may be that you need an increased dose of your medication. So those are kind of some things to think about. Okay. All right. The next question is about our favorite thing, night sweats. 
Um, can night sweats actually increase once you start HRT? This seems to have happened. For me. So if you notice that your hot flashes and night sweats tend to increase instead of improve, that it could be that the dose that we've kind of come up with for our algorithm for you might not be ideal. So if you tend to get worse symptoms, vasomotor symptoms, then we might need to tweak your estrogen dose a little bit. So, cause they should get better. They should not worsen after you start treatment. I would say in the first few weeks to a, first few weeks, really by the month, they shouldn't be doing that. Um, I do have some patients when they first started, you know, they tell me I never had hot flashes and I started and all of a sudden I'm getting hot flashes. Um, those will go away because uh, as the dose gets absorbed and your blood levels start to increase, that change in estrogen levels can trigger hot flashes. So for some people, when it's first started, um, as your blood levels are coming up, that can trigger some hot flashes. Um, but then after a few weeks, usually by th week three, week four at the latest, your levels are, are adjusting, your body's adjusting, your levels are, are um, not changing so much and the hot flashes should go away. So if it's that pattern, I would give it some time but if you're, you know, two, three months in and that's happening, that's a, that's another story. Okay. All right. We have a question for both of you, which is what is something you wish more menopausal or perimenopausal women knew or would start doing? Well, I think I, I wish more women would start talking about their transition and their symptoms, you know, with their physicians sooner. Um, the other thing I think that I would, I wish more women would do is really focus on themselves um, and really focus on their wellness and their health. You know, one thing that women are notoriously good at is taking care of everybody else and, and putting themselves last. Um, but really, you know, you're in this one body and this is the body you have, like you need to take care of it. Um, and as, as we're going through this aging process, we want to age gracefully. We want to go into this transition well, so, you know, really focusing on your health and wellness um, to include, you know, exercise to kind of help prevent osteoporosis, weight bearing exercise, but also, you know, seeing if you're a candidate for HRT and, and really optimizing your, your quality of life um, as you go through this process, um, eating healthy, but also, you know, really, this is the time to be selfish, honestly. This is when it's okay to be selfish and really focus on yourself. I wish more women would. Um, because I see, I've seen way too many patients over the years that, you know, see their health dramatically decline because they have spent so much time and effort taking care of everyone else in their family and all their other friends and, and not really focusing on themselves and their own wellness. So I think that's, that's my biggest piece of advice. I like it. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. Next question says, oh, actually it's a, it looks like it's good. Uh, that's a good comment. I am now just seeing weight loss changes. Thank, thank God. 15 pounds down with eating farm fresh. Okay. So not really a question, more of a comment. Um, that's great. Congratulations. Yay, Carly. Good job. Um, the question we have is what are the differences between the cream and the oral estrogen? So the differences between the cream and the patch for that matter, and the oral estrogen is really in how your body processes it. So when you take an oral pill, it has to be digested by your, your GI tract, like your stomach broken down and your intestines. And really there's something called the first pass, meaning that your liver does some processing of the things that we ingest. And, you know, basically your body has to do all of that before the hormone gets into the bloodstream and gets to the intended tissues. Whereas when you're using a medication that's delivered through the skin or transdermal, basically once it's absorbed into the skin and into that circulation under the skin, um, it gets into the bloodstream and can get into those tissues faster. So um, it tends to be, um, you know, less GI side effects um, compared to taking oral pills. So that's that's the main difference. And you avoid that first pass effect, you know, going through the liver. So tend, most patients tend to need a lower dose when they're using the, the through skin or transdermal methods compared to the oral, just because the medication is going directly into the bloodstream faster. Um, next, and it looks like, uh, well, no, we have two more questions. Uh, this question says my primary prescribed Premarin, is it safe to use Premarin in addition to other HRTs? So it depends on what type of Premarin it is. Cause there's, 
There's oral Premarin pills, which if you're taking an oral HRT pill, you absolutely need to tell your Winona doctor right away because we need to know exactly how much estrogen you're taking versus if it's vaginal Premarin because there's a vaginal Premarin cream as well. Um, the vaginal Premarin cream might be okay to take with your current systemic HRT, but you really need to let your doctor who's taking care of you know what you're taking um, so that we can determine if it's safe for you to have that combination. Yeah, normally that, yeah, I would, I agree. Normally vaginal estrogen cream doesn't really get absorbed so much, so it's okay. Um, but yeah, we, you know, we, we want to make sure that we're taking good care of you and we need to know what you're on, not just your hormones, but all of your medications um, so that we don't, you know, inadvertently cause you a problem. Um, so the, the more you tell us, the, the better we can take care of you. There's a saying that's two people you should never lie to, your doctor and your attorney. <laughs> so, yeah. You know, give us the information because we want to make sure that we do the right thing and the best thing for you. Okay, good. Uh, we have a question from Heather who wants to know, how long can you take HRT and is it safe if you're type 1 diabetic? So certainly if, if you're a diabetic, it's safe to take you know, this does not affect your, your ability to regulate your blood glucose. It's not going to affect how your diabetic medications work in your body because it's working on different hormones in your body. It's not affecting the pancreas or your own, your body's own insulin production. Um, so it's cert certainly safe for any diabetic, whether type 1 or type 2, to take HRT. Um, and really, the other question you said was, like, how long can she take it? Was that? Uh, yeah. So really for each woman, it's, it's unique in that, you know, we normally women might need this anywhere from three to five years, sometimes more. Um, really when, when you want to try to go off the medication, you can try a trial off the medication and we'll see if your symptoms come back or not. Um, if they don't, then, then it might be time that you can finish. Um, but, um, every woman's unique. So really it's a conversation you'll have with your doctor about when, when you want to consider going off the medication. Um, and I think so we have, we do have one more. Okay. Um, somebody's asking for clarification. Uh, it says it was my understanding that this yam based form is more readily available to the body and, and is a bioidentical hormone as in not synthetic, just started the estrogen progesterone cream. I'm just asking for clarification. Yeah, that's, this is yeah yam based bioidentical hormones. And, um, the concept is, um, and this is the way I like to explain it, there, there's something called receptors. And the way hormones work is they bind to the receptors, and then the receptors then signal the brain, and then the brain acts on that signal. Um, and so the better the medication fits that receptor, the better the response is going to be. So with bioidentical hormones, they're exactly the same as what your body normally makes. They're what that receptor was designed for. And so you get a perfect fit between the hormone and the receptor and you get better signaling to the brain and you get a better response. That's the, the, uh, the science and the concept behind it. With synthetic hormones, they're sort of close, but no cigar. They're, they're very similar, but they're not exactly the same. And so if you've, if you've uh, watched these before, you've probably heard this story, but when I was in college, I had this beat up old Datsun B210 that I drove around. It was a great car. <laughs> I mean, it didn't look very good, but it worked really well. Um, and my best friend had this 240Z that he had souped up with like, I don't know, triple Weber's and stuff that I didn't really know what it was, but he called it his core sheeter. And um, the funny thing was my key to my Datsun B210 would open the door to his 240Z. Um, and we would like, I said, oh, a Datsun's a Datsun, you know, but it wasn't good enough to start the ignition. And so that's the way I like to think about these receptors is that, you know, things can partially work. They can bind to the receptor and trigger some response, but they may not trigger the full response. And so we know that with bioidentical hormones, they're the exact hormone that that receptor was designed to, to see and to bind and you get a perfect match. But then synthetic hormones, they're not exactly the same and that match may not be as perfect. So that's sort of the end analogy I like to use. But all the Winona products are bioidentical hormones and they're all, they're yam based um, is, is where they're derived from. Okay, uh, looks like our last question that we have says, is it okay to use vaginal estrogen without taking HRT? Absolutely. So I think every vagina could benefit from vaginal estrogen personally. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yay. Wow. <laughs> I will second that, Dr. Cat. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's good. Oh, and um, people like your dots in the story. Um, Tara says so it'll help her remember the difference. Okay, and someone's asking, is uh, the vaginal estrogen like the e string? Yeah, est est string is is um, basically a, a ring that's embedded with estrogen hormone that's released over time. So if you've ever heard of the Nuva ring, which is a birth control method, it's a very similar concept at that. You know, the ring is placed in the vagina, the, the ring makes contact with the vaginal walls and the medication is absorbed through the vaginal tissues. Um, there's also the topical cream. Um, there's also um, little inserts. You know, there's a lot of different products out there, um, but we do carry a vag vaginal estrogen cream here at Winona. Um, the, one, the one plug is somebody mentioned Premarin earlier, Premarin vaginal cream. I always have to tell the story and I like to educate my patients what Premarin means and if you look at your Premarin tube, if you look at the little insert of the package, basically it'll talk about conjugated estrogens. But what they don't really tell you is they're conjugated equine estrogens. That Premarin was actually made, and the word Premarin is a shortened form of pregnant mare's urine. So they literally got these medications from the urine of pregnant horses. So <laughs> But certainly, you know, our bodies may not really optimally respond to those other estrogens that are in that conjugated blend of estrogens. So, you know, we tend to do best with estradiol um, and not the other excess of um, other hormones. So personally, I'm, I'm not a big fan of, of Premarin. I, I would prefer more straight estradiol in my opinion, but I always like to just educate patients on that because when they hear that, they're like, what? Pregnant mares urine, I'm putting that where? <laughs> So, and I disappeared again. This is my magic <laughs> act tonight. Your final disappearing act for, for the evening. There I go. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, I think we have one more, do we have one more or two more comments? Um, oh, is, okay, wait. Uh, well, no, there's a several. Okay, the follow-up is the S string. Is there a cancer danger with it? With the S string? Well, really with vaginal estrogen, the risk of cancer is much lower than systemic HRT. So typically the cream or um, a ring form or a pill form that's placed in the vagina is typically only locally absorbed. So even patients that have had cancers and that have been told not to use systemic HRT sometimes can use topical vaginal estrogen. So um, the cancer risk is much, much lower than systemic. Okay, and then I think this person is referring to Blossom, but I can't tell. It says, is Bloom safe to get in your mouth? But I think they mean Blossom. Oh, you're muted, Mike. Sorry, my dog was barking. Oh, that was your dog. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, oh, I better mute that. Um, no one wants to hear the dog bark. Um, I was on a call earlier today and my son in the background where they couldn't see sneezed really loudly three times. I was like, what was that? <laughs> anyway, um, we are real people in real places. So um, the Blossom Cream um, ideally is is, is uh, used about 30 minutes um, before sex uh, and it's pretty much fully absorbed by then. It's safe um, to engage in oral sex after using the Blossom Cream. Even if it's before the 30 minutes, there isn't going to be enough um, to be a danger um, to your partner. Uh, so I assume that's what the question is. Also, it doesn't leave um, any kind of bad taste or anything like that. Um, you should not directly apply the Blossom Cream to your mouth, but I don't think that's what your question is. Um, if the question is with oral sex, Blossom is, is safe to use um, and then have oral sex, that's fine. Um, and then somebody all, also has added that they recently had to increase their hormone treatment with Winona because their symptoms started to come back and they want to know if it's common and if they will have to increase it again in the future. So the, the dose of the cream sometimes um, does need to be adjusted, sometimes up, sometimes down, because the body needs change over time. Um, and that's one of the reasons that we check in with you periodically. Um, and ask you to tell us if something changes because sometimes uh, a dose adjustment is necessary. Um, the algorithm that we built um, to get you your initial dose is really designed to be a little bit, not much, but a little bit lower than maybe, you know, would be perfect. Um, for the vast majority of patients, it actually works just right. 
but I'd rather err on the side of less than the side of more. The idea being that I'd rather that we need to add a little bit because it's working okay, but it's not working perfectly, than have to back down because we cause you bad side effects. Um, and so that's sort of the way the, the algorithm is designed. So it's not unusual to have to bump it up a little bit, usually at the three month mark. Um, I would say the majority of my patients, we don't have to, but sometimes we do. It's pretty uncommon to need to decrease it, um, but it does happen sometimes. Um, but I found that some people, um, we kind of have to bump up, bump down, adjust now and then. Most people stay on a pretty stable dose, but some people seem to be more variable over time. Um, and it's just a function of how your body responds. Um, Esmeralda has a question about um, ovarian cysts. She says she has them and is an adrenal patient that menopause made it hell and Winona is helping her symptoms slowly, but will it impact the cysts? Well, that's good that your, you know, your symptoms are improving. Um, generally, as your body is going through this menopausal transition, the ovary kind of loses its activity. Um, and so, you know, the, the ovary creating those ovarian cysts, that, that should decrease over time. You know, you're not having the ovary um, basically recruit those follicles again like it used to. And so taking HRT shouldn't increase your risk of having ovarian cysts um, develop. All right, let's see. And I think this is officially going to be the last question. I don't see any others. What would be a sign that the estrogen dosage is too low? So if it's too low, you're not going to see improvement in the hot flashes or the night sweats. You're going to continue to have them. Um, and so that's something that, you know, if you're not getting improvement in those that initial symptom profile that you reported when you onboarded with us, then then maybe the dosage is, is, is not right for you. and We need to adjust. Yeah, I would add also that sometimes it's sort of partial. So maybe the, the hot flash and night sweats are better, but the brain fog hasn't gone away or some other combination. Um, but that would be, if your symptoms aren't improving, then we may need to add a little bit more hormone. And then I guess, uh, would there be any signs for if it were too high? Yeah, my telltale sign that the estrogen is too high is your breast tenderness. So. Generally, we start HRT, it's pretty normal to get breast tenderness, um, but generally as your body gets adjusted to it, you know, that goes away. But if you have persistent breast tenderness that's, you know, bothersome, like it hurts to wear your bra, it hurts to, for anybody to touch your breasts, like hugging someone hurts, then that means your estrogen content's too high and we need to tweak that a little bit. All right, I think that's everybody. Wow, we got through everything today. That's amazing. That's <laughs> that almost never happens. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Wow. Well, thanks everybody for being here for our March webinar and, and sorry for my disappearing act. You know, I don't know. <laughs> I kind of like it. I think it's cool. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it you made you smile quite a few times. <laughs> I'm looking at Angela and, and you, Dr. Green, and it's like, whoa, I've disappeared again. <laughs> gotta fix that. So thank, you, thank you to all the patients for coming out and coming in with good questions. Hopefully you learned a little bit more tonight. Yeah. Thanks to both of you too, for always being here and, you know, answering the questions and keeping and it. Thank you for uh, trusting us with your healthcare. Um, Absolutely. We, we take that seriously and we really appreciate um, the trust you place in us. Yeah. And don't forget to message your doctors in the patient portal because you can, they're there. So Anytime. Any time. Yeah. A nudge to remind people because I think, you know, people forget too that they can, you know, you're used to not having doctors available to you. So I think people forget that they can once you get your treatment that you can still message people. So yeah. Anyway, thank you everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night. Bye. See you guys. Thanks.